I'm not with espresso and all that fancy uh -huh. stuff. Give me a burnt ground. Like, give me the coffee that they give the truck drivers. Right. Because their life is on the line. <laughs> so if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. That's how I feel. Right. Are you under an isolation or quarantine order? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You gonna do that music video slow-mo thing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vince, what's up, man? And living in, you know, a pandemic. <laughs> so this is our first time meeting. I think we have a lot of people in similar camps that are like, yo, do you know Vince? And and uh, I'm glad we could we could link up. Who are these people? Tommy. I knew it. The, the podcast. I knew it was the Tommy. The podcast maven himself. Yeah, I knew it was Tommy. <laughs> it's always, hey, come to dinner. Like, no one wants to hang out with Tommy all day. No one wants to hang out with Tommy all day. I love him, though. Please keep this in the cut so Tommy can see it. He he knows I don't want to hang out with him. Tommy calls me every, uh -huh. probably every two weeks with a new idea. It's never the same idea. It's never a follow-up. Uh -huh. It's just he has a new idea of an amazing podcast that will change everything. Oh, he wants you to join his podcast network? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I get along with Tommy, so if you can get along with Tommy, you can get along with anybody. That's, <laughs> that's how I feel. All right, what was one of his ideas? Was it just like, yo, you need to start a podcast? It's always the same idea. It's just a different basketball player. And he put me on a group text with J.J. Redick out That's of nowhere. That's hilarious. Do you even know who J.J. Redick was? Of course. Okay, okay. But he was like, do you know J.J.? And I was like, no. And then I just got a text message to my phone. Uh-huh. And was J.J. like, when's the new album coming out? Or was it just like, hey, man, what's going on? Nah, we were talking about, um, we were talking about his basketball journey. Yeah. Via text? Yeah, via text. Because if you throw somebody in a group text, you don't want to you know, say anything. You just ask them about themselves and people start talking. Yeah. But I like J.J. Redick. I saw his uh, documentary. They had some documentary about him and his sister a minute ago, like about them growing up in the woods or something like that. Uh-huh. I was a big fan of that. Bro, the things you know, you know in a very deep way. Man, internet. And I don't really forget much. Shout out J.J. Redick, man. I support him, man. <laughs> Have you been listening to podcasts? All the time. It's my favorite thing. So there's this podcast I've been listening to. It's a Spotify original podcast called Renegades Born in the USA. Uh, it's with none other than one of your favorite musicians, The Boss. Of the boss. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen and uh, President Barack Obama, former President Barack Obama. Even the biggest, one of the biggest musicians in the world and the former president have to have a, a, a podcast yeah. on Spotify. But one of the things they talked about that I thought was really interesting is that both of them felt like outsiders, you know? Um, did you feel like when you were coming up, you know, in the music scene, coming from Long Beach, you felt like an outsider in, in sort of like the LA music scene? It was a big disconnect because I didn't have anything really in common with a lot of the kids. Because, like I said, we're kids at that point in time. And I come from, like, a Long Beach, you know, even though it's the hood and it's all these other things, it's extremely diverse. So it's like I've always been, like, even though I've never been like my friends, like, yeah. you live over here, you go to school with us, we play sports, all yeah. these other things, you the homie, we all friends. Right. But going to deal with music in Los Angeles and it not being that, it being, like, caveats to relationships and, you know, this and that and that, and then never being anything with any real implications or like of, if anything getting further, anything being life or death, yeah. I didn't understand why everything was so such a pressure situation. It's very, it's very cliquish and culty and music. Were people like you're from Long Beach? Like you're not really from nah, like nobody the LA. Knew I, was, I never told anybody I was from Long Beach. Wow. I didn't even know where I was coming from. So I'm like, oh, y'all gonna see they are, and I'll be there. Uh -huh. So they just thought we was from LA. Nobody knew where I was coming from. That's funny because for for me, the first open mics I started were in Sacramento, mm -hmm. and there was this feeling with all the San Francisco comics that like, yo, only road comics, only like comics that aren't gonna make it mm -hmm. start in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. But that's just where I was. I, I lived out there and I was going to school. Which is why I didn't tell anybody. Yeah, I, was I, I know I made that mistake. Weird. I knew it would be weird because yeah. it's just so far. Like, it's Long Beach has a weird stigma with it. It's the weird city. Like, so it's like, yeah. you know, people might not open up to you, be warm to you, but. Is, Long, is Artesia by Long Beach? It's like Long Beach, Lakewood, Bellflower, then Artesia is right here. Like, uh -huh. And Artesia is probably like four or five streets. Like, it's a really, really small city. But yeah, my mom used to get her eyebrows done at a place called Zeba. Yeah, I know. In, a, in, a, in, our, <laughs> in Artesia. I used to have to sit outside. It's like whenever we go to LA, I'd always want to go to cool places. I'd be like, Mom, let's go to like Anaheim. She's like, no, we're going to go to Cerritos and um, Artesia. Yeah, it's, 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 a large, it's a large population. With Long Beach, like everybody pretty much acts the same in that whole pocket. Uh -huh. So we didn't really understand that some of our friends were Indian growing up until we met their parents. Like, that's one that's thing about, hilarious. That's one thing about Long Beach. Everybody got the same voice, the same vernacular. We say the same words. Uh, I remember when our friends Israel, we didn't know his mom was Mexican. <laughs> and then she picked us up one day, and uh -huh. we were so confused. Yeah. 
and we was like, why didn't you tell us? And he was like, why did I tell you that? It's like, well, just, just so we know, like. Yeah. Because now I feel like I've been like ignoring the whole side of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, it, especially oh, that part, Artesia, Cerritos. Um, Bro, when you pull up there, like I, you know, when you're just outside, like just like eating a samosa, you're like, yo, if people drive by, you're straight up in India. Oh. It's all Indian people. You no, know, one thing I, I respect about California a lot, when you go into people's pockets, you're in a pocket. Like yeah. the language on the buildings change. Yep. You know what I mean? The stores change. Yep. The, it's, I think that's a very, very understated part of, you know, this place. It's dope. Yeah. Because just thinking about the fact that you have like these grocery stores where nothing is in English. Yeah. And you know, it's not a thing that people think about. It's just, you know. Not even. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing. It's kind of cool that you can just go into a green tunnel and just transport. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And there's so many small places yeah. like where I grew up that. Totally. You know, but diversity and acceptance was always a thing. So, like, I don't know, I, I guess in a sense you you would feel like an outsider if you come from a place where, like, everyone is an outsider that you're trying to break into a medium. Yeah. Even with my music, like, people would look at me or, like, here I'll talk or here I'll treat people. I'd be like, oh, this, this, his story can't necessarily be true because he's too nice of a person. He doesn't look like yeah. he would fit that bill. But that's, like, the point. Like, people don't understand these experiences until you, you say them. And when you try to share your experience, people might not always be receptive to it if right. you're not them. It's like, we live in such a weird vacuum, man. I mean, it's kind of like how President Obama said in the podcast, you know, America is a place for all people, you know. It's, it's a melting pot and it's, it's, we should lean on our diversity because, you know, especially traveling the world, touring, as, as you know as well, you go certain places in certain states and there'll be a, a whole bunch of people there that you never expected to see. Yeah. It's like, I remember my first time going to New Mexico and I just was, just shocked by yeah. like the way that the houses look, the way the buildings look, totally. what was in the restaurants. You ever play like Missoula, that? Montana? I've never played Montana. I've played Montana multiple times, and I'm like, yo, nobody's a nobody's gonna come out. B people yeah. won't get it, but they they get it. Like it's it's kind of dope that it's always a place you think no one's yeah, gonna come out. Yeah, and just show. like it's kind of cool knowing that all right, there's just a bunch of weirdos who may connect mm -hmm. with what I'm doing. I mean, there's some random places that were so just good experiences, Boise. Ithaca, um, <laughs> like um, Columbus, Ohio, yeah, Albuquerque, like just the middle of Arizona cities I don't even remember. Chico, California, like I've yeah. been so many random places where you know. Yeah, I've been to Chico on the Greyhound. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's it's, uh -huh. <laughs> it's crazy, bro. Uh -huh. just, these experiences, man. Like I just wish you know more people could have them. But one thing that is being shown through podcasts and you know just how far reaching we can be from a digital space is. I think we're at a point moving towards that everyone can experience a little bit of this based on things that they digest and like relationships that you can make. Like you, it doesn't take much to start a podcast. It doesn't take much to start, you know, a music career, a comedy career. You just got to kind of have that kind of faith. Even though we don't know each other and this is our first time meeting, I was telling you this like right when we came in, you have a very dark comedic sensibility. Like I actually see you more as a comic than musician. I hear that a lot. I think I'm like a pretty bright, like, you know, bubbly person, to be honest, but... You, you consider yourself to be an optimist? Man, all the time. Yeah, I get the nihilism thing a lot, but I don't really even necessarily know, like, what that means, like, because nothing has any meaning because you have to apply meaning to things. We see yeah. that, like, as the world changes and stuff like that, so... I don't really look at it as if, you know, since there's no meaning, there's no hope. It's like, if you can see somebody, like, you know, we name things, we create things, and we change them as we go. Like, nobody really knows what they're doing. So if nobody knows what they're doing, then that should allow you enough, you know, freedom to kind of figure out your own path or kind of figure out what you want to do in life. Because a lot of the times, man, I feel like people just kind of fall victim to kind of being like hopeless or like distraught or like feeling despair and like all that cute shit. If I know for a fact that nothing means anything, I'm going to go find something and I'm going to make it whatever I want it to be. And then I'm going to go mind my business. <laughs> if you're trying to get in the zone and you're about to go to the studio or you're just feeling like you're a little blocked and you want to write something, Who's on your Spotify playlist? Like, who are you listening to to kind of put you in a place where like, all right, I feel inspired to go make music? As crazy as this sounds, I promise you, I never listen to music. Ever. I get it, no, I get it. I listen to podcasts a lot. Yeah. But like, I'm more of a writer type person than a musician. I'm not really like, I don't know anything about, I don't know any instruments, I don't know keys. I barely even know how many bars it is in a song. Like. It's so funny that you listen to podcasts. It's, it's, it's so consistent that like musicians love 
podcasting, comedy, all that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. and comedians just want to be musicians. Like, well, I feel like I feel like you need a break from your reality. And your that's, thing, that but you that's do. that's that's creativity in a sense. Like when when you're when you're looking into something creative, you're looking for a break in your reality. One thing I tell people all the time is like, you know, everybody's normal. Like, no one's special, and I think no one being special allows everyone to be significant. If that makes sense. So it's like if you think about everyone's daily track, everyone's daily journey. You can't just listen to songs all day. You, you kind of have to know what's current in the world, what's current. And so that's one thing I didn't know when I was on tour. I don't know what's going on. Right. So I can, you, you can't gauge kind of what's going on. Like, it's more important to listen to people than to listen to music. I that's totally what you agree, bro. It's one of the best things about touring. Like, I, you know, I travel solo. So when I land at an airport and I'm just like in a taxi, just talking to the taxi driver, first of all, they have a way more interesting story than anybody in the city. Exactly. Like, they got wild stories. And then two, they'll kind of tell you what's what with what's going on. Like, rent's too high, rent's this, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. This is what's going on with the mayor. This is what's happening in the city. People here in Boston are this. Like, touching the city that way is way more important to me mm-hmm. than just like doom scrolling Twitter. When you become too famous and you're too disconnected from people Bro. and then things change, yeah. we don't understand that that's why. Yeah, like the second you stop talking to people and just being around people in that city, Mm-hmm. And just kind of get a feel for where they're at and what they're doing. Um, yeah, bro, you just like you completely lose touch. I have this thing. They should ask every politician, how much is milk right now? Mm. Like whoever's running for mayor right now in New York, mm-hmm. be like, yo, how much is milk right now? And they they should have three answers. They'd be like, this is how much it is at the bodega. This is how much it is at like the whatever the grocery store that th- that you got. And this is how much it is at the Costco over the bridge in Jersey. Some of these people like they have no clue. You know what I mean? What's your origin story? Like, where did you, how did you get into music? I actually need a little break from some things. Okay. So I had to, I had to move to uh, Atlanta kind of for a, a cultural reset, so okay. to say. All right. Until, you know, I was able to return. Some personal reasons? Hey, man, you know. <laughs> okay. You no, know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, just having fun, you know, being a kid. Gotcha. And um, when I came back, a lot of things that transpired that I didn't kind of like. So I was trying to switch paths, so to say. Okay. So I had this kid that was our friend. His name was uh, Dijon. You know, he had that one kid that's like a weirdo. Yeah. And like, he's kind of like not like everybody else. Like we always liked him, but he was like one of those kids. He used to live by us. And it was this kid named Chuck. He had a studio. He had a house on Janice. They was recording and doing little stuff, and I would hang out with them. It was never something good? I cared about. No, horrible. Okay. Um, Chuck had good beats, though, but at that point, we were kids. We were horrible. Like, you know, you're not good when you're a kid. Yeah. For the most part. If you are, then you're not, and this isn't the story. I was hanging out with them a lot, trying to stay out of trouble or whatever. They took us to L.A. because he was meeting Sid for something. They were doing, like, songs and stuff, and they're like, oh, man, uh, we're doing a party, a neck brace party. And uh, they was gonna get like five hundred dollars a piece or something like that. No, I was like, oh, I can do that. Wow. And and that's that's what happened. And here we are. Things, Did you, you always know? have this voice? Like I feel like you and Dave, Chappelle, Sonic, we have such a great distinct voice. You know, it's funny. It's a video on YouTube. Like, it's like a fight at the school I went to. Yeah. And I, I said something in the back of the camera, and one of the comments is, "Is that Vince Staples?" <laughs> and I, was, I was real upset. Yeah. So I, I pretty much had the same voice my whole life. Especially with comedy, having a distinct, like, octave sound is so important. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, it sells the joke, at least from the outside looking totally. in, it sells the joke. Totally. Having a distinct tone of voice in any medium, really, but you're selling yourself no matter what you're selling. Did you know you were good? Did you think, like, when you first started, were you good? Uh, not really. I mean, I was better than everybody else, but I wasn't good. How but, did you know you were better? Like, you just. I got, because I would record hear. and you could immediately. Yeah, they tell. were horrible. Wow. Well, I mean, when you're a kid, you don't have much of a life story. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, like, yeah, there's yeah. nothing to really talk about. A lot of my friends I was surrounded with are just people in general, like when you're that young, you have literally nothing to talk about. Now, the funniest part about that is that I didn't make music about myself ever until like, I used to just like, whatever the song was, like you, they would tell me what to rap about or tell me like, whatever the context of the yeah. song was, like if this is the name of a beat, then this is what the song is about. Just because at that point, I was just buying time and hanging out before I had to go back home. Cause I never really took it seriously. Like wanted to really be a rapper. It was just like a pastime or a hobby or some shit. Did it all happen accidentally? Yeah, 100%. Really? I had never tried to like really make it. Like anything. for me, I was um, in high school, I was a speech and debate kid. And I was kind of a knucklehead in class. And my teacher, shout out to Miss Takeuchi. I'm actually still trying to find you, Miss T. If wherever you are, just slide in my DMs. Yeah, call. Call me. Um, she's retired now. But Miss Takeuchi was basically saying, you interrupt in class all the time. I'll not send you to the principal's office if you just join the public speaking team. 
It's a good teacher. Yeah, she was really good. And when I'd go to tournaments, I could just make fun of the other kids and their arguments. Mm -hmm. And like the, all the judges were basically just parents who had to drive their kids to the tournaments. Mm -hmm. And um, they would always give me like 10 to 15 points higher. They're like, yo, thank you for... Yeah, like, making it fun. Yeah, yeah it's just boring. like, it's, boring it's, it's super you, boring, yeah. Yeah, you lined it up. You have like 15-year-olds arguing about, you know, like fiscal judiciary committee policy in like a city, and we didn't know what we were talking about. Yeah, like, and so I was like, nobody knows what they're talking about. Your dad is one of the judges. That's a conflict of interest. And uh, I don't know why we're talking about, you know, fixing the city when like the gym that we're arguing in has like a, a leak in the roof. How did that translate into comedy? And how did that translate into your comedic style and timing, you know, all that good stuff. Did it help you or did it hurt you more at the beginning? So I graduate high school, my freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. every, every kid in the dorms has LimeWire and Kazaa on their computer and they're just downloading um, everything. I obviously wasn't because I'm, I just like abide by the rules. Yeah, and, that's illegal. And I don't do anything illegal. Well, so it was all other that. people. And I, in fact, I witnessed that. And you told them to stop. And I, I said, stop it. I, and actually, my nickname in the dorms was um, DCMA Takedown Notice. Mm. So everybody in the dorms was, was downloading stuff. And um, one of my roommates downloaded all these stand-up comedy specials. And it was Chris Rock's Never Scared. He was wearing this, like, purple velour suit. And I just remember seeing everything that he was joking about. Like, he was talking about the war and politics and, and President Bush and all these things that I thought you could never say. And I was like, wow, he's doing funny speech and debate. And everybody's like, what? And I'm like, he's doing forensics. He's just making it funny. Mm -hmm. He has an argument. He's just saying it in a funny way. And um, it kind of clicked for me in that moment. And I didn't have any pop culture reference to stand-up comedy. Like my, my parents were immigrants. They didn't let me Mm -hmm. watch cable TV. And I didn't get to see any of that stuff. So I Google how to become a comedian. It says, call your local comedy club. I Google the local comedy club is the Sacramento Punchline. There was this very famous comedian performing. I didn't know who he was. So I called the club. I was like, hi, you know, I'm Hassan Minhaj. I'm, a, I'm an aspiring comedian. Um, I was wondering if I could open for Dave Chappelle this weekend. Mm -hmm. And they were like, what? And I'm like, well, on the website, it says there's a comedian named Dave Chappelle. He's performing. I heard that if you want to perform, you just call the club and you ask to have a guest set or an opening set. And I just kept calling and they, were, they, they kept hanging up on me. They're like, are you the Dave Chapley kid? We're not talking to you or whatever. And then I ended up going down to the club like Tuesday or Wednesday. And I was like, hey, you guys kept hanging up on me and I, I'm trying to perform. And they're like, you're the Dave Chapley kid? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, his name is Dave Chappelle. We thought you were like prank trying calling us. Yeah. yeah. And then they're like, just, just show up to the open mic night. So I just started going to the open mic night. But I was actually too scared to go to the open mic night. So I just went, I bought a ticket and then like I sat in the front row and a bunch of the comedians were awful. And I, and I figured I'm like, well, if, if they can be this bad. Yeah, like somebody, I can do it too. Yeah, yeah I can be just as bad as that. not that good yeah. is always, because I feel like a lot of times people are passionate about things, you know, necessarily not with a skill set, especially at the beginning of it. Yeah. But a lot of a skill set is just, you know, dedication and understanding and kind of taking yourself out of it. Because if you know you're not good, then you'll get better. But a lot of people just don't know that they kind of don't have it right away. Do you feel like if, if the first people you met were really good, you might have not done it? Uh, of course. I, but if they Like, were, had you met Tyler? Like, had the first person you met was Tyler, would it have been like, yo, maybe I shouldn't do this? Or maybe, me and Tyler oh, talk all the time. Tyler was horrible then, too. Really? He was the best one, probably because he was the oldest. But when I met him, like, if you asked Tyler about anything from that point in time, he'll be like, I hate that stuff. Really? Because, you know, over, over time you get access to certain things, you learn certain things, and now Tyler's like a, you know, a, a, a musician, musician at that. It's like, you're an aspiring musician, then you're a musician. And it's a big difference between those two. So I think at that point in time, like, I never was like discouraged or anything like that. Like, I, I don't honestly think I cared enough to ever like be affected in that way. Is it weird seeing your friends become famous? I think it didn't bother me because they were never really like my friends. Like, only because I come from so far away. So, to me, I didn't care about the music. I just didn't want to be at home. Right. So, I was trying to find, like, an escape route. We actually ended up living at my grandmother's house in Watts. So, I was taking the blue line, and then I was taking the red line. It was easier to get to L.A. You know every single, like, uh, public, public transit, transit route? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. Hell, man. I feel like some of the best comedy comes from the craziest shit that you've seen on public transportation. People don't understand, man. It's some real, <laughs> like, there's, it's some real there's people. There's characters. 
there's full on like fights. There's like there's like uh, series regulars that come on. If you want to survive on public character. transportation, you yeah. have to build a relationship with the smokers uh -huh. because the smokers live there uh -huh. and they kind of control the whole thing. Like it was this one dude that was always on the blue line. I can tell when he was high and when he wasn't. If he's high, get on his car because the police not coming to check tickets. Right. If he's in there a while, you know, he might piss in the corner. He might fall asleep. Yeah. You know, and you save a dollar fifty. Like you learn some life lessons on that train. So what's this last year been like for you? I'm I'm a homebody already. I like staying at home. So uh -huh. I, mean, I never had a home really growing up. So I was like outside doing stuff that I had no business doing. Like you give me a couch and like a TV and like some Wi-Fi, <laughs> yeah. you'll never give me to leave. Yeah, bro, it's been tough for me, man. My whole thing, like for comedians, the only way we get good is by being on the road. in front of people on the road or in the city. Like this past year for me, the benefit has been I've been around the kids a bunch, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. We had a pandemic baby. Mm -hmm. But the downside has been like this whole superpower, this thing that I feel like is my whole identity, mm -hmm. I just haven't been able to do. So like a bunch of us comics were kind of like, yo, are we still even good? Like, can we even still do this? Do you think it's more about life experience though or experience in the space? Because like for me, I, I think for five, six years, like, and I'm not even over exaggerating, yeah. we probably toured 90% of the year from the time I was like 19 to like I was 20 something. Wow, you toured that hard? Like, we, I think we probably did three tours a year. Like, and, and you wouldn't you wouldn't even like come home? Nah, you you had an not. apartment or whatever that you wouldn't even stay? It's funny, I would come home and then move. And then I would, and then I would, <laughs> and I would go back <laughs> yeah. on the road, but it's like, I had a couple of uh, deaths in the family and I, you know, you take those breaks to decompress, whatever. Right. And then that rolled right into this. And at first it was kind of hard. Like, I've recorded like probably, my engineers had like 180 something songs since Are like, you that prolific? Like you just come up with that much music? I just record fast. It's not always good, but I can make a song in like five minutes. I've never really took my time to make songs. How do you know, like what's your internal compass? Like who do you play the music for? But me, to be honest, because everybody really? likes everything. That's just so annoying. Everybody, people like to find like the brighter side of things and like, like I'm, I hate stuff like that. Like <laughs> you either like it or you don't, or like not even if you like it, uh -huh. because the wrong person likes the right thing, it can fuck your life up. So, you know, you kind of got to just, I think it's just staying power, um, realizing what kind of I feel like means something at the present time. Because you can make this song in 2018, that's the greatest thing you've ever heard. But if you wait six months to put it out, it doesn't matter anymore. So you can't have an ego and like you can't be too attached to it in the sense to where, okay, I made this song at the end of the year, then the entire soundscape and music changes. Now 80 BPM is too fast. So you have to wow. go, you know what I mean? That, that, that's a big thing in music is just the, the time changing because like if, even especially from a rap standpoint, like it was five new rappers last year that most people have forgotten about in the year before, in the year before, in the year before. Everyone has these moments in time and these people are making music previously, but certain people's success changes the trajectory of music. So when those things happen, you have to look at what you have and realize this might not be suitable for today's day and age. Is that terrifying, just the speed at which music is changing and how do you have staying power as a musician? Because one thing I feel like we forget sometimes, like it's not about you. Like even, even, even with comedy, right? It doesn't matter how good you think the joke is. If nobody laughs, nobody laughs. It could right. be the most in-depth, the most thoughtful, totally, the most yeah. morbid shit ever. But yeah. if they don't get it, it doesn't yeah, matter. They decide whether or not, yeah. I feel like it. a lot of these younger kids, because you know, I started making music when I was 15 and I'm 27, so it's been a long time. These kids now don't necessarily think about themselves as much. They're just kind of having fun with it. When I was younger, bro, and like you had a song, you coveted that song, you didn't want anyone to hear, you wanted it to leak. That was a thing. Now people are playing records on Instagram Live. And then if people like it on Instagram Live, then they'll put the song out. Like, it's not as precious as it was once said to be. And I think that that's a good thing because, you know, it's, it's, it's an experience. It's like, you know, if you, oh, I got this joke, but I don't want to tell it. Like one thing about, you know, Dave, Dave will try jokes out in front of three or four people and then, 50 people, 10 people, and then he'll put it in a special, but he yeah, won't feel he'll like- Yeah, he'll let it fly immediately. But yeah. he won't be like, okay, this I've, this is so precious that I can only try it on the biggest medium. I think yeah. that music is getting to that point now, which I think is good for like the people that's creating it. Do you have a genre of TV and movies that you really fuck with that you're like, this is my- I watch everything. Cause it's like- Rom-coms, the whole thing. Emily I love Perry. a rom-com. If it's on TV and it's interesting, I'm watching it. Wow. Actually, I was gonna—I was meaning to ask you this because you—you—you you love food, and this says a lot about a person. Best diner. Do you fuck with diners? Diners has better coffee. Oh, okay. Like I don't—I'm not with espresso and all that fancy uh -huh. stuff. Give me a burnt ground. Like give me the coffee that they give the truck drivers. Right. Because their life is on the line. Yeah. So if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. That's how I feel. Facts.
So one of the things they were talking about on the Renegades podcast, you know, President Obama and Bruce Springsteen for talking about their musical influences. And it's so weird because when I was at The Daily Show, Jon Stewart loved Bruce Springsteen. So I'm a child of immigrants, right? Growing mm -hmm. up in the house, all my pop culture references, I'm the eldest. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a big brother, a big sister to, to like kind of teach me things, right? So I remember John being obsessed with Bruce and I started listening to like some of his music and this is zero hype. I'm just listening to it for the first time. And he always has this like deep raspy voice, like just like, man, we were just, we were just kids from the city. Yeah. And we had, we, we crossed over that red bridge to the city. Mm -hmm. We knew that we would leave in that small town behind. I'm like, why is this dude's voice so raspy? Stand like, road. yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't understand. It's the outfit. I didn't, but I didn't understand the whole like, man, we were just, we were just two kids in a pickup truck, and we would, we would leave in that small town behind. I, I had no idea that he was the dude that like started that character. When you listen to Richard Pryor, mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, a bunch of comics yeah. were influenced by him. Look, man, you just gotta go to Jersey, man. It's the, it's the jeans, it's the t-shirt, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's the Bruce Spring scenes, it's the Lou Reed. I only know about two or three songs. Really? But you, I think a big part of music is branding. Yeah. Like, I think that's the most important part and always has been, in my opinion. It, it plays such a large part in who you are. Yeah. And I think that was the thing about a lot of dudes from that era. Like, things were still being created. I think in this point in time, everything's already been done for to a certain extent, you know what I mean? But when you think about your sound, what do you think it's linked to? Because I feel like there's this whole class of musicians now. I can kind of see the lineage, but you guys are just doing you. Before I started making music, I didn't listen to much music. Like I had yeah. never heard a lot of albums from like a lot of the bigger artists. Like, you know, like you were saying with the parents thing, I come up in an era of like uh, iPod. So it's like, if you don't have one of those, you don't have a computer to put the songs on, you had what you got at school. It got to the point to like, what I knew was like MTV jams, VH1 soul, like yeah. when I started making music, I started getting into other things and I kind of had the freedom of not necessarily having a favorite thing. So I was able to make mistakes and kind of forge certain things. But as far as influences, I, it's not necessarily for me. It's more so seeing people complete their visions and kind of sticking to them. So when you see someone's journey and you kind of see them doing things on their own terms and masterpiece, you know, certain people, it makes yeah. you feel like you're at Portis head. It makes you feel like you're able to create your own journey. Not necessarily say, I want to do that, but they did something that necessarily hadn't been done in that scope before. And it allows you to put certain things in your music. Like, it allows you to see that it's okay to be truthful. It's okay to be, you know, imperfect. It's okay to be vulnerable in your music, in a sense, because, yeah. you know, when you, when you give a song to someone, you're not necessarily expecting them to relate to it as much as you're expecting them to try to understand you. So in order to do that, you have to have, you know, that vulnerability. You have to have the kind of disposition of just an openness. Yeah. If you don't have an openness, then you'll never be able to truly be yourself. You feel like the, the music you make and the people, like your Vince Staples fans, you feel like your fans know you? Because that's the one thing that I noticed with, with comedy. Like, you know, I took a big influence from the way Kevin Hart tells stories. Mm -hmm. And Pryor was a storyteller. Chappelle's one of the great storytellers. They can kind of build things into this long arc. My storytelling style is a little bit different but I actually am just kind of paying homage to what they've done. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, this is an eight minute, 10 minute, 12 minute story about, you know, the way I proposed to my wife, or this is a 12 minute story about like the day my, my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. I'm just straight up paying homage to what they did so that every kind of new chapter of my life as new things happen, mm -hmm. I can just tell new stories and I'm growing with the people who like what I do, mm -hmm. you know? I think no matter what, you always kind of pay homage because it's like a craft. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. but that's elevation, but at the end of the day, it all kind of grows from one specific thing, and it's the first time it's been done. You know, a joke yeah. is a joke, no matter how you yeah. tell it. You pay homage by telling a story, but you don't view it as disrespectful to not tell the story the exact same yeah. way that they did. It's also kind of crazy that nothing really is new, per se. At all, ever. But one thing about comedy and music that kind of synonymous is that you have to kind of open up and tell the most uncomfortable parts of something. Yeah. And that makes it relatable to people. Because if they don't have that experience, they understand that uneasiness. Yeah. And that's kind of what brings out the laughter, brings out, you know, the joy and whatever, you know. I feel like that's what, one of the things that you do so well, you kind of troll yourself. Yeah, a little, Like, you know what I mean? But, but it's never that serious. Yeah, like. and like, I do that too in a lot of my stories where like, yeah, I'm the protagonist in the story, but I'm losing. Yeah. 
everybody takes themselves so seriously. So if if you're the butt of the joke, you're kind of low status. Every everybody else in the story is high status. Mm -hmm. They feel like, all right, we're rooting for you, you know. Nah, but we're definitely. all kind of living our life that way. You we know all I mean? answer to somebody, you know what I mean? And we all have low moments. And, you know, we don't need to be picked up when we're up. We need to be picked up during our low moments. So, yeah. you know, if you're vulnerable about those low moments, you know, you, you, you show the similarities. You know, one thing I tell people about music is once you're on the stage, you're on the stage. The hardest thing is to get on the stage. Once you're on the stage, you have nothing to worry about. So if you're already there, how do you connect with the people that are probably never go to the stage? You've never had stage fright? No, never. Really? Never. Even when you're acting? Like when you're doing the Vince Staples show and you're like, you're that's, doing that's stage. easy. That's way easier than rapping. Wow. Way easier because it's not as dark and it's not cues and stuff like that. Like, yeah. It's way, way easier than music. One of the best things that, that's happened for me is fatherhood and, and just having something outside of myself where it doesn't have to be about me. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do, I mean, like, let's just be real. We, we're surrounded by a crew, cameras. Mm -hmm. Kids is one of the few things that I have in my life, that and my wife, where they don't care about any of that stuff. I'm there to service and serve them and, mm -hmm. and be there for them. In Renegades, President Obama spoke about fatherhood and, you know, fear of disappointment and things of that when you're dealing with your children. I know you just had another child. Yeah. So do you ever feel like you could disappoint them or like there are certain pressures or how does that, how does that work for you? I totally get where he's coming from because being a dad is the most terrifying but most beautiful thing I've ever done in my life. Like, it's one of the first times in my life I felt like I can't die. I know that's like morbid. I, I feel you 100%. But my mom's always, she's always on the phone with me. Don't say this, don't joke about this, mm -hmm. don't piss this person off. And I've always kind of been like, I, I, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> and now that I have them, like when they look at me, I know they need, I don't know what it is. This is when they look at me, I feel like they need me. I'm the only person that cares about them unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Obviously me, me and my, my wife. So it's a terrifying thing because I know that I can't mess up. I have to be there for them. They see me for who I really am. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no hiding from them. Whereas with the show, shoot, whatever, you know, you, you, can, you can front a little bit, you can mm -hmm. hide. With your kids know who you are. Can't put it on at all. No, man. Like, they see every part of you. They see how not punctual you are. Mm -hmm. They see you angry. They see you upset. They see what type of husband you are. Mm -hmm you're exposed and so that's especially when you're spending so much time in the house with everybody totally you know? totally i know you had uh an amazing relationship with your mom mm -hmm. like do you want to have kids is that something that you're looking i feel looking like for? i feel like I, I never wanted to have kids when i was younger because i didn't know how long i was going to be around i think the older i get the more detached i kind of am from that thinking or that mindset but you have to like something special about kind of knowing that you're not infinite, you know, in a sense. Yeah. I feel like, you know, I, you want to... It's crazy because there's this whole camp of people right now that want to live forever. And I'm like, yo, that's the most tragic thing ever. You ever see like an old person at the grocery store and then they got like the... I saw this dude, he had some quarters and like $4 and he had, didn't have a belt on, he had the suspenders. It just looked painful. Uh-huh. I don't want to be 93, like... Yeah, it's just kind of like... I see life like an anthology series. Mm -hmm. Like, let it be a mini series. Let it end. I don't know, man. Like, it's always something that I, I thought was like, nah, I'm not gonna do it. But I mean, maybe one day when I get older. I like the kids. The kids like me. You know, I'm king of the kids around. The, you know, ask him. He knows his kids love me more than anybody. For real? Love. Yeah, I keep it fun. I keep it light. I watch the cartoons. Uh -huh. I give them the pretzels when they're not supposed to have them. Like, you know. Yeah. I saw. So I'm, I'm a good hang when it comes to the children. So you know, maybe one day I might have my own. But my kids are gonna be crazy. So. That's gonna be a, a that's gonna be a weird dynamic. It'll be dope, bro. I can't wait for you to see it. It's just it's just a cool thing. You gotta watch them because you understand what you're about to be dealing with. These kids are gonna be out of their mind. So you know, <laughs> have fun with them. I love the kids, man. Shout out all the kids. So obviously, this past year, year and a half has been crazy. Things are starting to open up again. Have you seen anything in this past year that is making you, you know, go into 21 and 22 and beyond and go, look, I absolutely have to do this? Has there been anything kind of life-changing in, in this quarantine that you want to... Things change from, you know, a point of view, but, you know, it, everything's still the same. You yeah. know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you said before, it's, it's always existed. I think it's important to not miss the moments. And I think that's one thing that I noticed from the pandemic because people were so highlighted on the money. Like we were highlighting the small moments that we had, 
not doing shows for a minute makes you want to do these shows. And one of these people, like, I've, I've, of course, there's a lot of people that you know that are regulars that come around. And like, I always wonder, like, how Liz is doing. Like, you know, Pete, who used to come to our shows early on, he just got, he just had his baby. You know what I mean? It's like, and you yeah. forge relationships with people, but it's like you can't miss these moments because, you know, you might not get them again. But make sure that even if it's not the, the specific moment, you know, when you get another moment, cherish it and try to live within it and not kind yeah. of look past it. That's it for me. What about it's you? It's wild, man. Like, I felt the same way. There's so many things that, I got to do that I wasn't really having fun while I was doing it. I was so stressed about just doing it well and being able to just make it that I didn't really, you know what I'm saying? Like I didn't, and, even, and eat, I didn't, are, even, I didn't even eat the food in the green room. I didn't, I didn't celebrate any of it, you know? Being so focused in and on things, which is a good thing because it helps you get to where you are. Yeah. But like we were saying, no one cares about any of those. Like they don't, the fans don't necessarily care if you stumble on this song or they you stumble on this show. They just want to see you. If you did one song and spent the rest of the show yeah. talking to the audience, they'll say it was the best show they ever Yo, seen Yo, so, so straight up, like, if the best artist that you're a fan of just did a meet and greet, that's really all they all people they care? Just want, they want you they to want know, meet Billie Eilish. They want you to know that they exist. And those are the moments that we're speaking of. You know what I mean? You can't right. focus. The moment's not, okay, is this part of this song or this and this and then. Now the moment is like the kid in the front like that says that they love you and they're crying. It's like, what the fuck are you crying for? <laughs> like, I, I, used like so, I used to be like, y'all are so weird. Like, what's wrong uh -huh. with you people? That's why like, I wish I would have paid attention more to those moments, you know? Like, I played two Coachellas, like, and I don't remember anything. Before. I played Coachella now, and after I got off stage, I went home. Like, I drove home. You got in your car, and you just drove home. Went you right went home. to sleep in your bed. Yeah, I went home. Like, That's hilarious. Right after I got off stage, like, I probably should have kicked it for a little bit. Uh-huh. Well, you know, it's always the next time. It's weird for me, man. This This year has been wild in the sense that a lot of my friends that I grew up with, a lot of people that I know, um, they're hurting, man. I remember older people would always tell me, nobody's coming to save you. Mm -hmm. This pandemic kind of showed me that. Yeah. Like nobody is coming to save you. At all. The government won't come and save you. You probably will get fired from your job. Like what do you tell people? Because you have so many fans that are like in their early 20s and you know. A lot of the younger kids from my neighborhood is like where I saw it the worst. And it's only because, you know, I'm going, like, we're doing these things, I'm going, like, you know, giving them groceries and, like, helping their moms with certain stuff and stuff like that. But I, I saw, like, the rapid growth of, like, 15-year-olds just seeing them change overnight. And I'm telling you, it took, like, six months. If I'm able to run up, like, a $7,500 Uber bill in two months wow. just to keep you from, you know, getting hurt, I know if, if it's 20 kids I could do that for, it's 5,000 kids I can't. You know what I mean? Like, right. So what happens to those kids? We gave some money to um, this initiative where they were just asking people for $500 to try to get Wi-Fi and computer access to the kids in Long Beach who had to go to school on Zoom. And it's like, yep. the fact that this is what these kids have to do and a large percent of these kids don't even have access to these things. Yeah. And then the library's closed. It's like, what do you expect these yeah. kids to do? And it's like, like you said, no one's coming to save them because the school doesn't care if you don't have a laptop. They're yep. not buying you one. I'm a mentor for this thing called the Boys Club in New York. Basically, it's a club, five bucks a year. If you're, if you're a young man, you get to go there and you have mentors and mentees, mm -hmm. kind of older brothers that um, are there to help you with homework. They got like a swimming pool. It's crazy. It's awesome, That's right? beautiful. But one of the things that I'm trying to teach them is so much of what I learned in school Mm -hmm. was complete garbage mm -hmm. that had no application to the way mm -hmm. the world is. Like people are like, go to college, get college debt, put your head down, get a job. You know, when my parents immigrated here in 82, they were buying into, they into you, that. Yeah. And my biggest fear is I got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I don't know what to tell them what to believe in. I was literally like raised to never believe any of that. Yeah. Like when I was in the 10th grade and I told my mom I'm dropping out of high school, she said, okay. And she understood it, so I had to leave too. Yeah. And it's like, that's not regular. You know what I mean? But it's not at all. I remember we, we were on tour once and I was explaining, a lot of people can't believe that I didn't graduate from high school. And I was telling, you know, Corey that it was a, it was a basic normal thing in California. And then we're in a room full of successful musicians, like people that are touring and doing things. And then he asked us, uh, you know, who graduated from high school? And I think out of 15 people, it was like two people had graduated high school. Yeah. And then we started looking into the numbers and seeing how broad it is. Like I think in, 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 the, in the city, like, about um, 40, 40, 44 to 45% of um, Cambodian kids drop out of high school by yep. the time they're 13. Mm -hmm. What's even sadder than like never having belief is like losing belief. So then you get to the points where everyone's in the same pot and then we start to fight each other because everyone's unhappy. I have two competing things that I'm trying to teach my kids. The way the world should be 
and the way the world is. And there's this, there's a gap in between that. And that's been my, been my biggest um, challenge as a dad. My mom constantly apologizes to me. Constantly, like, oh, I'm so sorry you had to deal with this, deal with this, uh -huh. deal with that. And in my whole life, I never once had any gripes with my mother, but it's the reality of the situation. And I think if I wasn't taught reality, then I would be nowhere right now. You know, you have to know where you sit in life. You have to know how to get out of it. And I feel like in America, we constantly lie to one another. We teach, we teach self-importance, but also like demeaning people. Like, oh, you should be great, but you're, you're worthless. It's like, that's what we do to people. And then you have people far reaching and trying. That's why you have such a strong celebrity culture and all these other things. Like, yeah. when, when bad things happen in the world, like people go to famous people to be like, what should we do? And it's asking that we feel like, <laughs> yeah, bro. you know, we're not special unless we're above and beyond. Thanks for sharing that, you know, being open with me, with us. I, with everything going on, I think it's important for us to try to connect more with each other. So happy it could be me here. Yeah, man. Those stories. Thanks for taking the time, bro. Man, I'll see you next time at dinner with Tommy. <laughs> yeah. And then when we'll go from there. Sure. Definitely, I That's appreciate it. That's what's up, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things I've done. So I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, bro. Please use that take. That's the most. Yeah, that's that's the one. That's the most normal one. If you don't use it, I'm gonna be so upset when I see you.